Hello, my name's Mike. You're watching Watch It Baptist Church Online. Uh, it's great to have you with us. We're looking for the last time at our theme of wisdom. Let's pray. Lord God, we don't really want to be anything else other than your people, seeing and understanding your ways and following them. Would you help us not to go running off ahead of you or to lose sight of you? Would you help us to be brave enough to follow where you go? Amen. So the title of this last talk is Wisdom and Today. Really, it's about thinking, what are the situations where we're going to need wisdom? We're not going to be able to do justice to all of them, probably even not going to mention all of them, but we are going to then try and take some of the theory that we've been thinking about over the last three sessions and say, what are the situations that we find ourselves in where we're going to need that kind of wisdom and how might we employ it? I think at the heart of that is uh, a concept called discernment. Now, it's a long and unnecessarily complicated, complicated spelling, discernment. It's got an S and a C in next to each other and all kinds of stuff. Um, but discernment is, I think, crucial both to wisdom and to our relationship with God and how we live it out. To discern something is to become aware of it or to realise what it is and to see it clearly, perhaps. And to illustrate that, I want to tell you a little bit of a story. There is a, an actor in America. Uh, when she was 17, she got into the famous Juilliard School and was delighted to have the opportunity, but um, also found it quite hard work. She got various roles after that, and she's now 40 and still acting and enjoying it. In her growing up and in her adulthood, she has really got on with radio entertainment and information. And she's a big fan from her youth of something called NPR, which I think stands for the National, um, oh, what does it stand for? National Public Radio, I think. Anyway, it's an American thing and it's a radio thing. And she became very familiar uh, with a particular voice who she heard every Sunday on NPR. Now, because she's a little bit famous, uh, she also got the chance to appear on some game shows in America. And on one occasion, there was a challenge on this game show to work out which of two people were telling the truth about what they did for a living. One of them was a crossword compiler and the other wasn't, but was going to pretend he was. And they had to work out which one of them was telling the truth. This actress, her name is Gillian Jacobs, had listened to the radio with this person's voice on it for her whole life. And so when she was given the opportunity to ask a question of these two guys, she said, when you are on NPR, how do you describe uh, who you are and what you do? And they both gave answers that were fairly identical. And she immediately know, knew which was which. There were four other panellists. No, there weren't. There were three. She was the fourth. There were three other panellists, and they were all frantically trying to work out how they could possibly decipher which one of these two was telling the truth and which wasn't. Julian Jacobs just sat quietly, uh, having already written down on the mini whiteboard that she had what her answer was, and she was absolutely right. She knew that voice. She knew that voice because she'd heard it a lot because she put herself in a position where she was listening over and over again and knew that voice so very well. That, I think, is the heart of discerning God. To listen to his voice so many times that eventually you just get really familiar with knowing what he sounds like. And in that situation, Challenges like we looked at last session, those passages from Ezra and Ruth and from Nahum and Jonah, where you seem to get two different perspectives from God alongside each other, they are easier to deal with because ultimately you're not looking to understand God just through 
the Bible that reveals him. You're also learning to understand what he does by knowing his voice. Let's have a little look at uh, a passage from Proverbs 1 and then a quote from a philosopher who wasn't Greek. Proverbs 1, 1 to 7 says this, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behaviour, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young, that the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance, for understanding proverbs and parables, sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The author, who identifies himself as Solomon, has a purpose. It is that others might gain wisdom, that they might be instructed, be willing to be taught, and that by being willing to be taught, they would gain insight. They would learn prudence. They would get not only knowledge, but discretion as well, to be able to tell the difference between what's good and what isn't, to understand those who are wise in what they say and how they say it. Solomon understood because he'd asked God to give him wisdom, that wisdom came from God. And so as he writes this, he's aware that wisdom comes from seeing things from God's point of view. When we think like him, we become like him. And we see this in Jesus too. He says, follow me and you'll see things how I see them. When we watch how he does it, we can follow his example and we get to know the father by looking at the sun. I know I've said that before. But wisdom doesn't happen by chance. You see, Solomon's call, and actually the call of wisdom in part two of our series, was a call to come and pay attention, come and get involved, come and take part, come and choose to learn. Come and be a participant in developing wisdom. It's like choosing to do what Gillian Jacobs did from our example at the start to choose to stop and sit and listen so that the voice becomes really familiar. I'm absolutely certain that the biggest advantage to doing in Jacobs of knowing that a voice did not come in being able to get the answer right on a quiz show. The benefit was from learning in that public radio format. It comes by choosing and from listening and listening and listening. I promise you, a philosopher who wasn't Greek, this guy was Roman, he's called Seneca. He's a philosopher and a writer, and he said this, no man was ever wise by chance. Now, we said earlier in the sequence that we don't get to be wise by default or automatically. We have to choose to get stuck in with pursuing wisdom. And that's exactly what Seneca is saying. Amazing, isn't it, how often we find people who don't know God and don't follow Jesus you seem to be able to grasp something of how God works. Now, choosing to listen to God, choosing to engage in wisdom, choosing to grow, are essential for Solomon. They're essential because we don't get anything automatically. The self-awareness is then is crucial, isn't it? Because unless we know that we need to do these things, unless we can understand ourselves well enough to say, actually, I need to do something here, otherwise it's not just going to happen by itself. If we're not self-aware, we're not going to get the benefit of this wisdom. And wisdom has a particular form. It, it works itself through in particular ways. James 3 is really good for this. He writes this, the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. And this sort of chimes with, I'm going to do another philosopher here, but this one isn't Greek or Roman. This guy is um, 
13th century Islamic poet and mystic. And he wrote this, yesterday I was clever, so I wanted to change the world. Today I am wise, so I am changing myself. His name is Rumi. And again, we see echoes of a Christian understanding in that. It's awareness that actually, if the world is going to change, it changes with me changing me. And I can't change me. I need God to change me. So I go to God and say, like Solomon did, give me wisdom. That way I have something with which I can make a difference. How can we know that we need to be transformed? How can we know how we need to be transformed without self-awareness? How can we identify the ways in which we need to grow, the areas of patterns of behaviour or the assumptions that need to be challenged unless we spend some time looking at ourselves through God's eyes? There's a, a band I'm a big fan of called Drakeford, again, based in America. Um, he's the guitarist and lead vocalist, and she is a um, British vocalist, and they are uh, living in Nashville now. But there's a song they do called Whitewash, and it has these lyrics. Instead of pointing fingers, we should find the faults within us, because we've all got this blood on our hands. Self-awareness means that we recognise that we're saved, by Jesus, by his sacrifice and his mercy. And so his blood is on our hands because he's died, he's had to die, so that we might be reunited with him, so that our life can be fulfilled. And because of all that, it's important that we start, as we, as we consider how the world works, we start by looking within rather than outside, that we, we don't get preoccupied with who else has got things wrong and how. Wisdom that is lived out is expressed in so many different ways. Let's just turn back to that passage from Proverbs 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behaviour, doing what is right and just and fair. Now, if we want to be those who do what's right and just and fair, if we want to be those who have prudent behaviour, and we don't just mean nice behaviour, we mean godly, sensible behaviour, then we're going to need to acquire wisdom and then live that out in the reality of our day-to-day -day life. So wisdom needs to be applied to personal relationships. How we interact with our brother or sister or spouse if we have one or children if we have them. All of those interpersonal relationships with the, with the next door neighbour, with the um, person who serves at the supermarket or the post office, all those things. The easy people and the difficult ones. How we go about personal relationships needs to be through, to be worked through with wisdom. But also how we engage with politics. And I don't mean if. I mean how we do, because there is a world, a real world out there, where local or national politics or global politics is an essential part of how things are actually happening. Massive amounts of injustice are being carried through because of political leadership and political lobbying. But lobbying is people campaigning for a particular thing to happen for a particular reason because they think it's important. How we engage with politics needs our wisdom. How we respond to the media, and I don't just mean how we might write into our preferred newspaper, but actually how we might respond when we see the news on the television. Also how we respond to social media, how we conduct ourselves through Facebook or WhatsApp or Instagram or Snapchat or TikTok or whatever it might be. The internet is not full of wise people. In fact, I think there's a Jane Austen quote that says something like, angry people are not always wise or something like that. There are an awful lot of angry people out there, and many of them are using social media. Isaac Asimov put it like this. He's a science fiction writer. He said, the saddest aspect of life right now is that science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. Our world is really good at knowing stuff and really awful at being wise with how it handles it. I, I would say that the development of technology that allows global communication through the internet and social media, that has grown way faster than the wisdom 
that people take into it has grown. That's a real concern for me. And that also means wisdom needs to challenge what's called confirmation bias. I think we've spoken about this in an earlier session. So confirmation bias is where you come across an idea um, or a perspective, and if it says what you already think, you then assume that that's what's true because it matches with what you already, it confirms your existing point of view. And wisdom doesn't have a lot of time for confirmation bias. Wisdom challenges, asks questions. As, as Solomon put it, um, Proverbs for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young, let the wise listen and add to their learning and let the discerning get guidance. In the middle of all of this, I want to take you back to that example from the beginning, Gillian Jacobs, and the knowledge she had, the, the familiarity of that voice that she'd only ever heard on the radio. She'd never seen the person's face, but she knew who they were by their voice. Doug Larson, American journalist, wrote this. Wisdom is the reward you get for a lifetime of listening when you would have preferred to talk. We only gain wisdom by learning our master's voice and listening. And we only learn that voice by listening and then listening some more and listening some more. Final quote. As Max Dupree says, we cannot become what we need to be by remaining what we are. Wisdom isn't automatic. Wisdom will come by choosing to embrace it. And that means listening, learning our master's voice, choosing to be transformed, going day to day back into the metaphorical library of God's understanding, sitting opposite him in a, in a chair or kneeling at his feet and saying, talk, God, I need to hear your voice and I need it to change me in all the ways it needs to. We only become wise by listening to God lots and lots. And with that idea ringing in our ears, let's pray before we ask our questions. Lord God, help us listen. Help us to realise how important it is that we do listen. Help us to seek wisdom by listening. Provide for us those around us who will point us to listen. Help us hear you, we pray. Amen. So we have three questions as always, and question one is this, glasses required. Why are we sometimes less willing to put the effort in for wisdom? Question two, and this might overlap with question one a little bit. It might not, but it might. Question two, why is listening to God sometimes hard? Question three, what are you going to do to gain greater wisdom? Well, thanks ever so much for being part of this journey as we've examined and talked about and thought through wisdom. I look forward to catching up with you soon, but I also look forward to having the chance to talk with you about what your experience of wisdom is and how you are looking to grow in it. God bless and take care.